All right, everybody, it is Lisa Robottom and Tara Boothby, and Lisa is an amazing part of our team, um, and so I love learning from Lisa about mental health and uh, mental health labels. Like, Lisa has a great way of just sort of talking about what a person might be diagnosed with or questioning, and how do we make sense of that? So let's break down some mental health labels, Lisa. Sounds good. So yeah, I think um, that area I find is of interest to a lot of people because if you don't work in the, the mental health area, it's pretty easy to kind of think, well, does this fit maybe ADHD and does this fit maybe, you know, maybe I'm anxious, I don't really know. And so um, what I thought we would do is just work through a few of the more um, prevalent diagnoses that we see and do a little bit of a description and a discussion of each and see where we go from there. Perfect. So I thought maybe we'd start with ADHD. Yeah, I think that's great. We get a lot at Sojourn and I think just around town, a lot of people are questioning ADHD or they've been diagnosed. And that makes sense because what, like 50% of the population has ADHD and there's some hereditary components. So if a parent has ADHD, this is what Dr. Poitras told me the last time I was in his office is that it's actually 40% likelihood that the child gets it. And I think if both parents, it's 60%. I can't quite remember. Yeah. Well, ADHD is actually one of the most um, heritable mental health challenges out there. Um, most of our um, other information on some of the other disorders is more like, you know, 10, 15%. So when you're working with like 40, 60%, um, you're working with something probably as close to certain as we're ever going to get in, <laughs> in mental health. Um, and one thing I find really interesting is that um, there's a lot of, of uh, fear around the stimulant medications that often get prescribed. And, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I don't know, you know, if I want to take something for it, or if I want to just work on it on, on my own and uh, see if I can get some coping techniques in. And it's, it's definitely something we can give coping techniques for. Um, I probably would also speak to your doctor about the medication because, you know, stimulants are a relatively safe medication. Um, yeah. according, you know, the, mm -hmm. so it's good to explore both angles for that. I agree. And I actually, I mean, this is, I was so biased about ADHD. I really don't know as a clinician or a person, I don't believe I gave it enough credit um, until my husband just got diagnosed. And I, I knew he had ADHD, but I was like, look at your success. As well, you don't need a label, you don't need medication. I kind of downplayed ADHD, but what I find now seeing my husband go through getting medicated and, and honoring that more with my clients is like, I actually believe that ADHD is one of the, the concerns that I see benefits most from medication. Yeah, absolutely. Because it, it really is, um, you know, chemical abnormalities in the brain. And there's not a lot that you can do to make the brain change and make more of those particular chemicals. Um, so I think the one thing I run into most actually with ADHD is, and I probably should say when we talk about ADHD now, a lot of people are familiar with the ADHD, ADD. Um, and what they did is they actually collapsed that into one diagnosis. So you're either ADHD hyperactive, ADHD inattentive, um, and then there's different specifiers, but it all now falls under the ADHD umbrella. But one of the things I find most working with adults is that a lot of adults, the ADHD inattentive type was missed. Mm. And the research shows that a lot of times it's missed primarily because, you know, boys are expected to be rough and tumble and, and busy and girls technically by our cultural standards back when I was young, you were expected to be, you know, quiet and busy in the corner and doing these things. And, you know, as long as you were quiet and, and focused, you weren't really an issue. 
But a lot of people, when they hit adulthood, start running into issues at an adult, like not being able to finish anything, not being able to keep anything clean, not being able to be organized, procrastinating all the time, um, feeling disconnected from the people around them, feeling like they just don't fit. Um, things like anxiety levels. Anxiety is something that likes to hang around with ADHD. So there's often higher anxiety levels. Mm -hmm. and without the diagnoses or looking at the diagnoses, a lot of people take those on as personal failings. So I'm just lazy. I can't keep my house clean because I'm lazy. Even though you know you wish with all your might you could and you start and then you wander off and you're doing something else. And you don't even know how that happened. And so I find that for most of the people I see when we discuss the idea of ADHD being possibly present, that it's just like light bulbs go on. Yeah. They're just, that's why that's happening. I'm not, you know, this lazy, horrible, awful adult, you know, I can't manage my money, but that's why. Yes. Yeah. And that like difficulty maintaining love relationships or jobs and not having a felt experience of satisfaction and that sort of like I, that achievement. So adult ADD is really, I think we're giving more space to honor it, but what's interesting is it often gets misdiagnosed as depression or bipolar, which is also interesting. We're going to talk about those things, but it's, it's, it's not a childhood disorder. And I think most of us know that now, but in case somebody's listening and they're like, aren't you supposed to outgrow it? Um, the, I, I forget the percentage, but it's close to half of people with ADHD will continue to have it in their adult life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just looks really different because of the way the, with the brain development, you know, Maybe hyperactivity doesn't mean you jump out of your office chair and run around the office like you did when you were in school, but you know, maybe you really, really fast all the time and nobody can do you. And, you know, so it looks different, but we're starting to realize that, you know, it is the same processes. It's just an adult presentation of them. Yes, exactly. And it, I took a training in the fall on ADHD and couples therapy. And what I loved was they talked about, you know, like our brain is like this library that we carry around. And for a normie brain or non ADHD brain, because nobody has a normie brain, let's just put it out there. You know, yeah. Everybody has a weird brain, but I have more of a library in my brain, whereas my husband has what they termed a flat brain. So for me, I can take down a couple books and I know I have three books down and open somebody with ADHD. It's like everything is open at all times. And that's why it's so hard for children and adolescents and then adults. It's, it's the same complexity. Um, so maybe we can talk a little bit about, I don't know, where do you, what do you think move into depression or bipolar? Because they kind of look similar. Why don't we talk a little bit about depression? Mm -hmm. Just we can move over to the bipolar because there is a depressed aspect to the bipolar. So, um, yeah, depression, I mean, that's something that we hear that word a lot in kind of pop culture or you know, even in our day to day. Oh, I'm feeling really depressed today or really, you know, down. And it's almost become part of our vernacular to the point where it just is another word for sad. And so a lot of times what I run into is when people are actually diagnosed with depression, they'll tell somebody that they're struggling with depression and people will be like, well, just feel better, <laughs> you know, like, okay, so you're just sad, like get over it. There's not that same level of um, understanding that comes with it as with some of the, the more um, rare, well, the rarer mental illnesses like schizophrenia and that sort of thing just because of the way that we use the word now. Yes. And but, I mean, the vernacular is important because if I say, Oh, I'm, I think I'm depressed or depressed, depressed. And then somebody comes to me and they actually are depressed. If I'm, you know, not really pausing to consider what is depression for myself, then how can I empathize with somebody who actually is depressed? That's a really nice challenge. Mm hmm. Yeah, just to, you know, it's one of those things just to challenge our internal biases and our internal assumptions that sometimes we don't realize we have. 
um, I think it's always useful. Um, probably one of the things I should mention is that um, as psychologists, like psychologists, psychiatrists in North America, we use um, a manual called the DSM to help us sort out our diagnoses. And so under each type of diagnoses, there are several different criteria that the person needs to meet at least a certain number of them to be considered to have that diagnosis. So um, with something like depression, I believe offhand there's 10 criteria that a person could meet um, any, I think it's sixth of, me. I could be incorrect on that, but um, so some of them are, you know, a change in sleep habits. Someone who is depressed will either sleep a lot or not be able to sleep at all. And that the piece that people often miss is the not being able to sleep at all. So if somebody's sleeping all the time, sometimes people are like, oh yeah, well, they must be depressed. But if you can't sleep at all, you know, that one gets missed. Um, it's also an alteration in appetite. So eating, um, you eat too much, you eat less. If what it more is, is a drastic change that's unusual for you, as opposed to a change to specifically one thing. There. Um, the one that I actually find most interesting is that irritability also applies to an adult presentation of depression. A lot of times when people talk about irritability and depression, they apply it to children. And, you know, it is part of the child's diagnosis, but it's almost like it's assumed it's not. But an increased level of irritability is associated with depression. Yeah. Anger, anger. And, and that is, it's so important to acknowledge because people, it makes sense. I'm so shut down for so long. I've lost my sense of motivation. This is where I can get confused with ADHD, but it's, it's hard. It's like, I'm walking through muck. And then of course I might get irritable and angry. Yeah. One of the things actually, I don't remember what training it was in, but it was, it was quite a while ago that we were talking about, you know, how anger and sadness tend to like to hang around together. And, you know, oftentimes where there's a lot of sadness, there's usually some anger back in there too. And, you know, depression is really no different. Um, so normally, you know, if you're falling into a depression to qualify for the actual full diagnoses of it, there's usually a drastic change in lifestyle. So may you, you know, so it's not like you're feeling kind of down. I mean, that is definitely something we apply it to. And, you know, if the mood drops, speaking to your doctor about an antidepressant or something like that is definitely worthwhile. But, you know, generally when it hits a major depression, the person's life just stops. Yeah. There's no motivation to do anything. You know, they usually don't want to get out of bed, whether they're actually sleeping or they can't sleep. They tend to just want to sit at home and just ruminate and think over and over and over. And, you know, sometimes they cut off contact with friends or they just they can't go to work and they end up on leave of some sort. So, you know, with a major depression, you know, you're seeing it when the the person's life just seems to start falling apart because they just can't do anything anymore yeah and it's it's hard to come alongside of somebody who's depressed there i mean a depressed person i think is frustrated with themselves and this awareness of uh, a, a felt experience of being unlikable and then coming alongside it's it's natural to be very frustrated with this person again you've noticed a sizable shift in what they're doing it is good to talk to a doctor about medication another great a couple other great tools one in particular is, is exercise is always good cardio is really good for a hot brain it's hard for people who are depressed an adhd individual might have more capacity to go and hit the treadmill somebody who's really, really in the depression, it, it sometimes medication is one of the only first steps because it's just so hard. The other thing I want to hear your comment on Lisa is uh, with depression, we always think depression, depressed people are suicidal, but mm -hmm. depression and suicidal, suicidality are not always joined. 
No, not at all. Um, and a lot of times, actually, the um, kind of loss of motivation and the, the desire to not get out of bed and do these things will actually save a person from ending their life because they just don't have the strength of will it takes to actually end your own life because you have to have a certain level of will above what the rest of us have to follow through with that. And depression can pull all of that out of a person. And, you know, even if a person is depressed, you know, there may not be any sort of suicidal thought. It may be more, you know, this is how it's always going to be. The world is awful and, you know, people are awful. Things going to get better, but there's no desire to end their life. You're right. And it, because it is more, the depression maybe is more synonymous with hopelessness or despair and despair. And so if I translate or associate hopelessness with suicidality, then that might be a feature for me, but I can just have hopelessness without suicidal thoughts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah. So good, good little comment. And then what do you think like bipolar, because this is a, um, a a part of, or, uh, what would you say a type of depression, I guess it's under the Mm -hmm. umbrella of depression. So, yeah, so bipolar is one of those ones that also I think it's a little bit in our vernacular too, where it's like, oh, I'm just so bipolar today. So a lot of times what I see, because you're right, depression is a piece of it, but I see when people have mood fluctuations that uh, their first thing, you know, oh, I must be bipolar because I was really happy yesterday and today I'm not really happy. I'm feeling kind of blah. Um, Whereas bipolar is much more on the extreme. So you may be having some mood fluctuations or some moodiness, which is out of the ordinary for you. But if it hits bipolar, it actually starts to interrupt your function. And so the difference between a major depression and a major depression within the bipolar diagnoses is that in the bipolar diagnoses, it um, cycles. So a major depression, your mood is okay, and then it just drops off and it's down there. Mm -hmm. Where with bipolar, then, you know, if you have the the depressive version of it, you know, your mood is up and then your mood is down and then your mood is up and then your mood is down. And I mean, I have patients that rapid cycle where in the course of a day and it's, it's so, so dramatic that you can't, I mean, you can't keep up. So normally, you know, if you're looking at kind of what we think of as um, bipolar, which would be bipolar one, the the manic depressive type, you're looking at the really, really lows to a really high high to the point where there's reckless behavior. There's, you know, they're taking chances. They think they can do anything. You know, someone might go clean out the bank account and invest in some random business because they just know that this is going to be good. Or, you know, they might leave their family and like tell their wife they want a divorce and move to another town and I don't know, look for a new girlfriend. Or, and so there's such an, there's an excess of behavior, mm-hmm. an healthy point with mania and then with depression it crashes obviously down to kind of this more inhibited type behavior right and that that um oftentimes with the mania there's that grandiosity there's a grandiose and there there's a powerful belief and I think that that's something that is I experience with um, the bipolar individuals that I come alongside of is how powerful the belief of hyper or manic is and how powerful the belief of hypo and that utter worthlessness, hopelessness. It's like, it's really painful. It's a very painful um, uh, condition for people. And I, another interesting thing with bipolar is this this sort of fear of being judged. Yeah. That their belief is people are going to find out I'm bipolar or they know and they just think I'm trash now. So it's so sad. 
Yeah, well, I think one of the, the biggest challenges that mental health um, diagnoses face, and this is another aside, is how it's presented to us in the media. Because oftentimes what's presented to us in the media is presented incorrectly mm-hmm. and at the same. So people who see a fictional depiction of someone with bipolar will see it to the point where there's probably like I don't know, 1% of the population that ever gets bipolar that extreme, but that's what people see. And so if you have the diagnoses of it, that's where people's minds go. Yeah. So this, they're scary because they could become manic and kill me. Well, you know, the odds of that ever happening to anybody are very slim. Um, and schizophrenia is another one that gets that all the time. You yeah. know, I've worked with hundreds of people with schizophrenia. None of them have ever killed anybody. No. And I mean, every schizophrenic client that I've had, I have such deep admiration for them. I've, I've found, um, you know, again, that stigma. It's like, I actually, these are people that I've always really loved this client base and found these people to be the most some of the most enjoyable or wise talented like it's a very uh, misunderstood diagnosis yeah absolutely and so kind of going back to the the really strong belief excuse me because we also see that in schizophrenia but you see it with bipolar too that really intense belief where that becomes reality and so often what i do or what i tell people when i'm trying to explain kind of what a really intense belief not grounded in reality is, is I'll tell them, okay, so what if I walked up to you one day and said that the sky's pink and you looked at me and went, the sky's blue. And somebody else was like, no, it's not, it's pink. What are you talking about? And you know that you know that you know, you look at the sky and it's blue, but everybody around you is telling you the sky's pink. Now, how hard would it be to let go of your belief that the sky is blue simply because everybody else is telling you that's not right. And it's, it's very similar for these really intense, strongly held beliefs. Yeah. Like it's, and it's, we can't just do a conscious treatment with, with some of these real chemical um, imbalances. That's where medication is essential or some of the the new more modern treatments for like, um, uh, deep depressions, bipolar, schizophrenia, because it needs a subconscious shift. I can't just say, you know, my version of the sky is pink is like, you're valuable, you're worth it. Like people don't think you're trash because that's too conscious. It's this subconscious, like I, I'm utterly committed to my worthlessness. Yeah. Yeah. And it's hard. It's really, really hard. Yeah. Well, and there have been some really interesting advances in terms of treatment for depressed, depressive symptoms. You know, there's a lot of different medications out, um, but we now have an RTMS machine in the city. So that's exciting. What it is, is it targets just one particular area of the brain with an electronic or uh, yeah, with electronic stimulation. So it kind of gives it a little zap. And there's a certain period of time that they do it. And then, and you're conscious for it and it doesn't cause you, well, it's a little uncomfortable, but it doesn't cause you a lot of pain. Mm-hmm. It helps depression majorly. And then, you know, the, the exploration of different kinds of, different kinds of drugs out there. Um, you know, the ketamine treatment that people will get, or, you know, there still is your, your old kind of standby um, ECT, which looks nothing like it does on the movies, but you know, there too. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of stuff out there that really can help with depression that people aren't usually aware they can even push towards accessing. Yeah. And that's where to talk to a medical doctor, get a referral to a psychiatrist from your doctor or psychologist is really good to explore like ketamine. I haven't had any client personally who's had that treatment because it's quite new to the city. Um, I've seen amazing, amazing things at Sojourn with different clients, with working with different psychologists who have gotten ECT and it can be transformative, uh, especially for very stuck depression Yeah, Yeah. or just very stuck um, chemical imbalance. Like I've seen it with very stuck OCD as well. Um, So do you want to say anything more about bipolar or should we move on to move on? 
so, on to some what do you think anxiety yeah anxiety is a nice well I was gonna say it's a nice light one but that's <laughs> oh, it's easy it's a functional one uh, yeah because actually one of the things we were talking about earlier just before we started was the idea that you know mental health in general is a real spectrum and I think you know, a lot of people think, well, if I don't have like the far end of the spectrum where I can't function, then I should be able to deal with it myself. But in reality, you know, it's a spectrum. And if it's interfering with your life, then it's okay to get it treated somewhere. Yeah. So, yeah. So, I mean, anxiety is one of those that, um, actually, I think the best explanation I ever ran into was, um, it's like a fire alarm in your kitchen. Anybody who's seeing me for therapy for their anxiety, you know, all about my metaphor here, but um, it's like that fire alarm in your kitchen. So it's there to protect you, actually, but it can't tell the difference between an actual fire and my lousy cooking. So it's going to go off for both. And it's the same thing for our anxiety system. We need some level of anxiety or we'd like you know, walk out into the middle of the road and get hit by a car because it would never occur to us to look. But it's when it becomes so high that it's interfering with the way a person wants to live or it's making a person really unhappy or, you know, it's just something that they're always uncomfortable with, then it's definitely something that needs addressed so that we can get that system to settle down and only go off when you actually need it to. That's a beautiful metaphor because I will say like um, being analytical, think, think, thinking and anxiety go hand in hand because it's like whether your flavor of anxiety is just like a general anxiety or there's an obsessive and compulsive feature or PTSD because they're all connected in the anxiety umbrella area. But it's like we overthink, think, 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 think. So real or imagined threat is a term we use with PTSD, but that really fits with anxiety. It's like, I'm thinking about something that maybe could happen, maybe couldn't. The other thing that, that I think about anxiety, it's so sneaky. It yeah. always sounds like the truth. It's like just parallel of the truth. Everybody should like me. That's yeah. such a terrible false belief. It's a false belief. It's toxic thinking. It sounds like a great idea. It's going to get me anxious if I get stuck on it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It is. It's, it's one of those, one of those that likes to just sort of sneak in there, like you say, when they're not looking. And oftentimes I actually will work with um, individuals I'm seeing on the idea of seeing anxiety as something separate that's from yourself. It's actually trying to steal your life. So that when you are starting to have those ang anxious thoughts, you can say, oh, no, that's, you know, sometimes they name them, sometimes they don't. But, you know, that's my anxiety. They're, it's trying to take my enjoy the enjoyment out of my life right now. So I'm not going to go there. Yeah. <clears throat> and it's different than depression. So I, when we're talking about suicidality, su suicidality and anxiety can also go together. Don't have to. But it, I'm curious what you would what you would say, Lisa. Um, I, an anxious person might actually be more motivated. There's more potential risk for suicide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, just knowing the chemicals in the body and how that shifts when you have high levels of anxiety, mm -hmm. you are, because there's certain emotions that are energy producing emotions, and they they're like that for a reason you know, like anxiety produces energy for the fight, flight, or freeze, or, you know, fear produces energy so that you can get away or anger, whatever. So anxiety naturally brings with it this surge of energy that mm -hmm. can get things that normally they never would do. Yeah. It feels like adrenaline. It can get us into all sorts of trouble, uh, aggression, um, it can, like anxiety can look angry. Anxiety can look afraid and panicky and anxiety can get us sane and doing things, get our, our mouth can get us into trouble. Um, and so it's, it's, it is sneaky and it can be really powerful when I love what you said, Lisa, and I totally agree when we, it stays inside of us. If I believe I'm stuck with anxiety and I'm always going to be feeling this. 
-hmm. of course I'm going to want to escape. Yeah, Mm -hmm. absolutely. And, you know, anxiety can get really, really, really extreme to the point of being debilitating. Now, people who can't leave their houses or people who can't um, sit still ever or, you know, so anxiety is one of those ones, again, where it's often viewed as kind of this, um, you know, it's something that you can function with to a degree. But again, just like everything in mental health, it's a spectrum. And when you hit the top of that spectrum, it can really do a number on you. Yeah, and crash. And then this is also really um, nice to differentiate anxiety attack, panic attack. Yes. Yes, that is that is uh, definitely something that we run into a lot. Um, because naturally, when our anxiety kicks in, there are physiological change that, changes that happen to our So our breathing rate will increase, our heart rate will increase. You know, there's some people have to go to the bathroom a bunch. Some people feel sick to their stomach. I mean, most of the theory is that's our body trying to lighten itself up so we can do what we need to do in the moment. So a lot of times people experience those symptoms and label them a panic attack when that's actually not the case. It's simply, you know, I mean basically an anxiety attack because your anxiety has ramped up mm-hmm. and it's important and it's it's pain it's hard it's very very hard and it's that like I'm stuck in this body and that's uh, a lot of times when people actually reach out for help when they start to have those intense anxious episodes but then a panic attack is really important to know the features of that as well yeah so a panic attack is quite different because you're dealing with almost like an intense freeze response. And so oftentimes, most of the time, actually in a panic attack, there's a fear that you're going to die from what's happening to you. And your body can have, you know, involuntary things happen to it physically. So your hands may cramp up or you may, you know, start to hyperventilate, but like you can't see anything or so it's it's quite intense Mm -hmm. and you get you know you get dizzy and and have trouble inhaling any sort of but there's a sense of dread that comes with a panic attack in terms of this is going to kill me Mm -hmm. that often doesn't come with an anxiety attack and a person in an anxiety attack is a little more functional you can still think, you can still make decisions. Where when somebody enters a panic attack or has a panic attack start, it's like the brain basically shuts down. Yeah. And it feels more, it mimics a heart attack. Whereas an anxiety attack, yeah, racing heart, but this is like heart cramping. This is like concerning people will call the ambulance, you know, because, and somebody who sees this, if they, if they um, are with you, they, they will be concerned. Like what is actually, this is very, very significant. Whereas anxiety, it's like more about, I can't, I can't reach you. I can't calm you down. Yeah. And so, you know, both of them, like you said, are equally, Mm -hmm. um, equally, I think challenging just in a different way. So, but the way that you would work with anxiety and an anxiety attack is different than the way you would work with a panic attack. And so for us as clinicians, it's important for us to clarify, okay, what are we actually dealing with here? Are we dealing with a panic attack in case, you know, desensitization is usually the the recommended course, not always, but usually, whereas with an anxiety attack, you may go about it a little differently in terms of. I might teach you how to calm your body and I might teach you how to kind of, you know, mindfulness like that. So that's why I think it's really important to be able to know the difference. I agree. And what I, I'd never heard it said this way and I'm maybe it's common, but I just hadn't had somebody talk about the dread feature of a panic attack. I find that really helpful. And I'm like, yes, that makes so much sense. And the different feel of working with 
like pure anxiety versus like dread anxiety and dread, dread anxiety. Frequently there's some relational trauma immediate or that's been shaken up in the trauma container and then it's bubbling up from the past. So that's really helpful. Anything else? Like, I think that's pretty good summary of anxiety. The other thing that we we've talked about, but we didn't clearly say with anxiety is it's much more physical. Like there's a lot of physical features with anxiety, all sorts of it. sweating can even be one, but all the other parts that we've, we've talked about lots of peeing. Yeah. A lot of times when I see somebody who's struggling with anxiety, they've been to their doctor a bunch of times because they think something's wrong, you know, yeah. not all the time, or I can't sleep or, you know, my stomach gets upset all the time. Or, tummy, tummy, tummy. Yes. Yeah. And so normally they've been through their doctor over and over and over. And finally the doctor's like, you know, maybe you should go talk to somebody. And a lot of times that's what it is, which is often really relieving to hear, you know, that it's not something that's going to kill you anytime soon. It's that, you know, your body's defensive system keeps kicking up and we need to calm it down. Exactly. And then too, so first off as well with children, like when I say tummy, 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 so like with little ones, that is almost always where it starts is I got tummy aches. I don't, I got tummy ache, can't go to school, separation anxiety or whatever might be going on, being bullied or worrying that teacher likes me and I'm not talking about it. Um, but then also that, that stomach thing is just so normal with adults or sort of dietary concerns. I've been doing cleanses or trying different things. Um, but if you're resourced enough to go to your doctor and say, Hey, I'm worried I'm sick. I'm worried I'm sick. That's also a really hopeful sign that, mm -hmm. that your anxiety is actually something that when you come in and you talk to somebody, we're, we're going to be able to make sense of it because you already are resourced enough to know something's wrong with me. Yeah. 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 I think that's where too, we kind of loosely say it's, Oh, it's, you know, a nice, easy one. It's not easy, but it's just different because there's, there's a different sense of, okay, we can finding hopefulness can be easier with anxiety. Yes, absolutely. I think finding hope, hopefulness and a lot of times working with the individual and the symptoms of it can be easier than in some of the other diagnoses because first of all, I don't have to convince you there's a problem. You know, when you come to me, something is not right. And secondly, most people with anxiety are very motivated to change it. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so, um, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's nice to talk about all these different, different parts. Um, and then just like we, we talked about, or I mentioned PTSD and OCD, mm -hmm. and we thought we'd just sort of touch on these two a bit because we'll, we'll talk more about, we're going to do a couple more of these. So we'll talk mm -hmm. more about OCD when we talk about compulsive behaviors. But I guess, okay, so what about PTSD? Like, that's really a hot topic right now. And I mean, we've all been, had our lids flip for like however many months. So it kind of makes sense that it's a hot topic. Yeah. yeah. Um, PTSD, I find, is actually, from a, from a research clinical kind of standpoint, quite an interesting phenomenon because it involves um, a miss, almost like a, and uh, interruption in our general memory system. So something happens that's so traumatic to us that it overwhelms that area of our brain. So it doesn't do its job to file that memory away with the other memories in our lives. Um, and so actually, I also should say that a lot of times we can assume people should have developed PTSD from certain things, but it really varies person to person what, what will or won't cause. So if you're experiencing symptoms, but you're like, well, I've never been to war, you know, it, it happens for other reasons. So it's definitely something that's worth following up on. Yeah, real um, or imagined threat. So there's something that has threatened that memory image is beautiful this memory image is threatening. And then when I put it in the filing cabinet, it's always just kind of sticking out a little bit. And so whether it's real or imagined, my brain doesn't know the difference. Like our brain doesn't. Yeah. And it could be like war. It could be relational trauma. 
it could be car accident. It could be, there's all sorts of things. It, it's trauma to me, big, big T trauma, little T trauma. If it's stuck hanging out of the filer, filer, then, um, then our brain just keeps kind of touching back on it or getting stuck. Yeah, absolutely. And it does, you know, it doesn't always contain what we traditionally think of as flashbacks. Like there are flashbacks in a form, but a lot of times, again, probably a pop culture thing, but, you know, you think flashbacks, you think, oh, I must be like back in the scene and I don't know my reality anymore. And, you know, a lot of times it's demonstrated as being that, um, that intense when in reality, flashbacks can be quite a few things, you know, it can be experiencing pain at the trigger of a certain smell. It can be, you know, experiencing, um, you know, a, a sense of dread when you see a certain color. Yes. So, we're saying, and it's, it's, I think something that is definitely treatable, it takes a while and there's, there's some new treatments out there too that have just started coming out. Um, and it depends on the therapist as to which way, because there's different, different treatments options out there. But I think the key with that is it's okay to seek help for it, even if it's not happening because of what we could, would consider a massive trauma. So, you know, if something unhappy happened to you as a child and you can't step away from that and it keeps pulling you back, pulling you back, pulling you back, it's okay to come get that treated. And as psychologists, we're not going to say, oh, well, you know, you didn't, I don't know, get blown up in a car bomb or something. So therefore you can't have PTSD. It's, it's very uh, person to person. And there's really, you know, it's really important that you don't just live with the symptoms, but that you come and get some help for them. Yeah. And I, I think that's really valuing Lisa. It's a quite a common concern for people. And there's a little bit of criteria in the DSM. How long have these symptoms been going on, which might be six months is the sort of notable point for PTSD. But then we also notice that there's acute stress reaction um, prior to, and really if, if it hasn't been going on for six months and you come in and we start working on it, we're probably going to be able to shift it more quickly. Both Lisa and I do EMDR. And I think EMDR is such a beautiful resource for this stuff. It, it can work. Um, but also too, like I think of my own trauma reaction and what really got me for what, when I noticed my trauma reaction and maybe I had more of an acute situation in my young adult life. Um, and it was more of like my, I just got really stuck. Like I couldn't make sense of it. And so my flashback was just like, honestly, like I, I, I couldn't believe, can you believe this happened? I couldn't, it didn't make any sense. It didn't fit with any of my beliefs about myself in the world. And so for somebody else, it's just like, that's nothing. Like, why are you complaining? But for me, I felt very incongruent with myself. I didn't have PTSD, but that, that, that is like a person in that situation long, long term is just this real sense of like, this is my version of, of stuck or flashback reliving. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, I like too, that you're noticing that it's not always dreams and things like that. Like that's again, some of what we're shown on TV, that this is what it will be like, but it's not for everybody. And then it is for lots of people as well. It looks different though. Yeah. yeah. As you can yeah. tell, one of my pet peeves is that when you work with these type of diagnoses all the time and then you see them like portrayed so inaccurately in the media, you're just like, ah, you know, that's I know. Not I know. And then I think too, that for, for people, I just want to say this to you, your pain matters and we, something's not right. We believe you. So it's some, sometimes people will go and read up on something and then they try to prove like, I'm supposed to be having dreams. I'm supposed to be having bad dreams. And they try to prove that to themselves. Your ver it's, it's unique, different flavors of the same. There's continuum of mental health and there's different 
intensities and there's different features. It's going to be very unique for, for each individual. Bipolar does not look the same from one person to the next. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's actually interesting. I was, I was doing, um, I was doing some research into borderline personality disorder, and we're not going to go into that today, but there's a selection of, I think, nine criteria, and you have to meet, I think it was six, my numbers might be off, but when you work that out statistically, that's over 256 different manifestations of the disorder, and so that's a massive amount of variation. You know, and we use our experience to kind of fit the pieces in and and um, figure out and help you figure out what's actually happening for you. But that just tells you how different it could look for for anybody. Yeah. And it's interesting um, as I think we're starting to wind things down. And, and two of the things we want you guys to look forward to is we're going to do a segment on personality disorders and then we'll do something on compulsive behaviors, addictions um, self-harming and, uh, obsessive and compulsions, like all that stuff as well. But it's this, um, you know, just honoring that it's so difficult to, to have a label. This one label is going to fit all of these people. Labels are useful for us because they're a bit of an anchor reference point, And then we can find the uniqueness of an individual. Um, but that's why I think the DSM says, has such a hard time and they keep trying to figure out how to invent our diagnostic manual because it's so hard. And the DSM-4 is what I was trained on and I loved it. And then the DSM-5 was just like, this is so different. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And I think, you know, when I'm working as a psychologist, yeah, I, you know, I have in the back of my mind, okay, am I looking at something, you know, that might fit a diagnosis, but normally, as a psychologist, I'm more interested in your symptoms mm -hmm. struggling with than I am whether or not I can give you a label. Yeah. You know, communicating with psychiatrists because it's a very medical model. Um, they work great for insurance companies and that sort of thing. But truly, you know, if I'm treating depression, then whether it's major depression or you know, dysthymia, which is a lower grade depression, I'm going to come at it at a similar way because it's a depression. Yes. I think that's also something to keep in mind is that, you know, labels are helpful sometimes for some people, but sometimes you don't necessarily need one. A hundred percent. And what I love about what I love about our team at Sojourn, what I love about um, therapists that are attachment minded is, and you can hear it in Lisa speaking right now, and Lisa does a lot of CBT and all these really cool, helpful um, modalities, but Lisa and I believe myself are examples of, it's, it's about seeing people's humanity. Like no matter what you're going through, you're not, no, you're not trash. Mm -hmm. And that's the, the stigma of mental health or having a diagnosis is that people people are going to see me as some version of trash. And it's just not true. We're all people like everybody else. Sometimes we're good. Sometimes we're bad. Sometimes we're happy or sad. We're depressed. Sometimes we're broken. You know, and it's just like, we're all just people. Absolutely. So, yeah, I think that's about all I have to say. Awesome. Okay. I love talking to Lisa and this is brilliant so um thank you for sticking in there with us you guys this is so inspiring and helpful um it's always nice to talk shop with a colleague and then lisa and i are going to come back over the next couple of months we'll do um those other two parts and then probably more because we'll just keep thinking of great ideas yeah oh yes <laughs> all right thank you so much lisa you're welcome have a good afternoon you too bye